a 19-year-old university student was kidnapped and murdered by a man who'd offered to help her replace her flat tire. In September of 2019, at approximately 8 a.m. on the 24th of the month, physiotherapy student Mariana Baza departed from a gym in Bariri, Brazil, with a friend. After her colleague had already left for work on her motorcycle, Baza noticed that one of the tires on her car was deflated. A passerby later identified as Rodrigo Pereira Alves, aged 37, approached a young woman and offered to assist her in fixing the flat. CCTV footage from the exterior of the gym captured the initial interaction. Alves then crossed over to the other side of the road and was soon followed by Baza, who drove her car into a small lot outside the purview of the surveillance cameras. Baza took a picture of the man as he worked on her vehicle and sent it to members of her family, including her boyfriend, Lieutenant Navy Officer Jefferson Viana. As the latter later told the police, Baza indicated that she wasn't fearful of Alves at the time she'd sent the image. That message marked the final communication made by the young woman prior to her death. Security cameras recorded Baza's car being driven from the scene roughly an hour later, but investigators believe that it was Alves operating the vehicle. One of Baza's relatives attempted to contact her later that day, but was unable to reach her. The student was subsequently reported missing, and local authorities launched a manhunt for Alves after gaining access to the picture Baza had taken of him. Officers descended on the suspect's residence in Itapolis and eventually located him hiding on the roof of a nearby house. The man confessed to the murder and revealed that he dumped the victim's body at a sugarcane farm, 40 miles from the gym at which he'd first encountered her. Alves was reported as an individual with an extensive criminal record and had only been released from prison a month before he carried out Baza's murder. Investigators later established that it was Alves himself who'd slashed the young woman's tire in the first place in order to entrap her. Number 6. William Hussel An Ohio doctor was charged with multiple counts of murder for prescribing fatal doses of pain medication to a number of his patients from 2015 to 2018. During his tenure as a critical care physician at Mount Carmel Health in Columbus, 43-year-old William Hussell had allegedly ordered dangerously high doses of fentanyl for at least 25 of the individuals entrusted to his care. One of the cases for which the doctor was criminally charged involved a 63-year-old woman by the name of Beverly Scherzinger. Hussell had reportedly given the elderly patient 500 micrograms of the synthetic opioid substance, which medical experts characterized as a lethal dose. In October of 2017, Scherzinger passed away not long after Hussell had told the woman's family that her prognosis was bleak. A hospital staffer alerted local authorities to the doctor's suspicious behavior, and an investigation into his conduct led to his arrest on June the 5th of 2019. Detectives didn't disclose what they believed to have been the man's motive for distributing the deadly dosages to his patients. Prosecutors contended that there was no legitimate medical basis for Hussell to have administered the drugs in such extreme quantities. The former doctor filed a motion to have his murder charges dismissed, but a Franklin County judge eventually denied his formal request in December of 2021. Number 5. Sidney Loof in November of 2017, a young woman was murdered and dismembered after being lured on a date with a woman she'd met online. On November the 14th, 24-year-old hardware store clerk Sidney Loof of Neely, Nebraska, went on her first date with Bailey Boswell, also 24, whom she'd first encountered on Tinder. After their initial meetup, Loof was excited about seeing her again, as she'd reportedly told her colleague, Tella Gehring. Loof sent a message to her friends on Snapchat prior to her second date with Boswell the following night. She then failed to show up to work on November the 16th, prompting her loved ones to report her missing to local authorities. Loof's remains were eventually found by investigators on December the 4th, three weeks after her abrupt disappearance. Her dismembered body parts had been discarded in several trash bags. The investigation conducted by Saline County Police led them to arrest Boswell and her boyfriend, Aubrey Trail, aged 51. According to court records, Boswell had brought Loof to Trail's residence on the night of their second date, reportedly hoping to recruit the victim into the man's cult. At one point in the evening, 
Trail allegedly strangled Lou with an extension cord in an effort to keep her from alerting the authorities to his and Boswell's supposedly illicit lifestyle. During a court hearing in 2019, Trail attempted to slit his own throat while loudly declaring his girlfriend's innocence. He was ultimately sentenced to death in June of 2021, while Boswell was given a life sentence later that same year. Number 4. Anthony Sutheran A woman was found guilty of fatally starving her landlord in order to inherit his multi-million dollar estate. By the time of his death in 2014, 59-year-old Anthony Sutheran's health had already been in severe decline. The reclusive millionaire required a living caretaker which prompted 62-year-old Linda Ricard, a former social worker and trusted friend of his, to move on to his farm in South Newington, Oxfordshire. Ricard subsequently orchestrated a plot to steal the wealthy man's fortune by forging his wills for him and his elderly mother that made herself a beneficiary of his estate. The woman successfully convinced Michael Dunkley, Denise Neal and Shanda Robinson to sign the fraudulent will as witnesses. Ricard then proceeded to deprive Sutheran of food and medical care in order to accelerate his imminent passing and hasten her coming into control of his wealth. She discouraged visitors in an effort to conceal the fact that the old man had become dangerously emaciated. Sutheran's death hadn't initially aroused suspicion, but an investigation was launched into the matter after Ricard was found to have taken hundreds of thousands of dollars from her former landlord's bank accounts. She eventually confessed to carrying out his murder and forging both wills in January of 2020. Dunkley, Neil, and Robinson were all found guilty of fraudulently signing said wills and were sentenced to prison terms varying in length from 24 to 32 months. Ricard was jailed for a minimum of 28 years, while her husband was sentenced to 10 and a half years himself. Number 3. Gabriel Ujlaki A teenager from Nevada was abused and murdered by a close friend in March of 2020. The victim was identified as Spring Creek resident Gabriel Brittany Ujlaki, a self-described cowgirl with an expressed passion for horses. The young woman had been reported missing on March the 8th. Three days later, her body was found with slash wounds on her throat in a remote area of the desert near the city of Elko. On March the 19th, the Elko County Sheriff's Office announced in a press release that they'd arrested Bryce Dickey, aged 18, whom the victim had known from the rodeo circuit for many years. Dickey had publicly mourned Ujlaki's loss on Facebook in the days following her disappearance, but he was ultimately charged with open murder in connection to her death. Investigators reportedly found bloody boots in the young man's closet and a contraceptive device near the scene of the crime that had traces of both Dickey's and Ujlaki's DNA on it. Dickey had allegedly created a fake alibi during his initial interviews with the police, claiming to have witnessed the victim climb into a green pickup truck with a tall cowboy on the night she went missing. He faced a first-degree murder charge for killing a girl who'd reportedly considered him to be her big brother. Number 2. Breck Bedner On February the 17th of 2014, a teenage boy was murdered in Essex, England by a friend he'd met online. Before his violent demise, Breck Bedner from Caterham, Surrey, was a member of the Air Training Corps who'd spent a significant portion of his spare time playing video games online with his friends. Through his gaming sessions, Bedner had become acquainted with an unemployed computer engineer named Lewis Danes, aged 19. The latter soon joined the online gaming group to which Bedner also belonged. As their friendship progressed, Bedner's mother, Lauren Lefebvre, began to sense changes in the boy's personality and ideology, which she attributed to the negative influence Danes was having on him. In December of 2013, Lefebvre contacted Surrey law enforcement to express her concerns over the possibility that her son had become a victim of online grooming. She provided little in the way of actionable information for the police to follow through on, thus her impassioned warnings were largely ignored by the authorities. On the day of Bedner's murder, he'd hailed a taxi to take him to Danes's apartment, where the two were to meet in person for the first time. Later that day, Bedner's 12-year-old siblings, who were triplets, began receiving messages that 
their brother was dead. Danes had reportedly sent photos of Bedner's body to their gaming group and the images were subsequently disseminated on social media. Emergency responders were called to Danes' flat, where Bedner was found with fatal stab wounds to his neck. He was pronounced dead at the scene. Danes, who was described by his neighbors as reclusive, was ultimately sentenced to life in prison for the murder. Crown prosecutor Jenny Hopkins called it one of the most cruel, violent, and unusual cases with which she'd ever been involved. Essex Police Emergency. Hi there. Uh, hello. Um, I need police and a forensic team to my address, please. What do you mean? What's happened? My friend and I got into an altercation and I'm the only one who came out alive. Are you telling me you've killed somebody? Yes, I am. Right, and who am I speaking to? My name is Lewis Baines, I'm 18 years old and I live... You're telling me he is definitely dead? I'm telling, yes, I'm telling you he's definitely dead. Number one, Keeley Bunker. A 20-year-old woman from Tamworth, England, was assaulted and murdered by her childhood friend on the night of September the 18th of 2019. Keely Bunker was accompanied by a close female friend as she attended a performance by British rapper H at the O2 Arena in Birmingham. The pair were reportedly celebrating Bunker's recent birthday. After the concert had ended, the two women met up with Wesley Street, also 20, whom Bunker had known since they were children. The group went to a nightclub where Street became extremely intoxicated after allegedly consuming three drinks for every one the girls had had. They later got a taxi back to Tamworth, at which point Bunker's female friend offered to let her stay the night at her apartment. The young woman refused, claiming that she was tired and wanted to sleep in her own bed. Bunker also said that Street would walk home with her and ensure she got there safely. The following day, Bunker's uncle found her lying face down in a brook in Wigginton Park. Her lifeless body had been hidden beneath a pile of branches. A post-mortem examination of Bunker's corpse was performed during which it was determined that she'd been strangled to death. Street's DNA was found on her body and he was subsequently taken into custody and charged with murdering his trusted friend. He claimed to have accidentally killed the young woman as they supposedly engaged in consensual relations, but he was ultimately sentenced to life in prison. Number 8. Yesenia Morales On July the 18th of 2021, a Colombian lawyer and her boyfriend went to a popular bungee jumping spot that was located on a bridge in the town of Amaga. Having never bungee jumped before, 25-year-old Yesenia Morales was later described to have been quite nervous while awaiting her turn in line. There were approximately 100 people on the viaduct that day, and subsequent reports indicated that Morales and her boyfriend were roughly the 90th visitors to take the plunge into the 150-foot gorge. Morales' partner was up first. After attaching the bungee cord to his ankles, the workers gave a signal that he was prepped and ready to jump. Morales, in a state of confusion brought on by her extreme anxiety, misconstrued the signal as being meant for her and she mistakenly jumped off the bridge without a cord attached to her. The young woman's tragic leap was recorded by another tourist on a nearby cliff, and the video was widely shared on social media in the incident's aftermath. Horrified and distraught, Morales' boyfriend raced to the bottom of the valley and came upon her unresponsive body, at which point he fruitlessly attempted to perform CPR. By the time emergency services arrived at the scene, Morales was already dead, and a post-mortem examination later revealed that the young woman had suffered a heart attack before impacting the ground. Number 7. Maggie Tarasca Student pilot Maggie Tarasca experienced an aircraft malfunction during her first solo flight on September the 9th of 2018. The 17-year-old began her journey at the Beverly Regional Airport in Massachusetts, with a course set for Portland, Maine, roughly 90 miles away. Shortly after taking off, however, the plane Tarasca was piloting lost its right main landing gear wheel. Speaking after the incident, the teenager detailed how she desperately tried to suppress her overwhelming stress and anxiety as she coordinated with the air tower on how to land the craft safely. 
Beverly Airport manager Gloria Bouillon later revealed that Tarasca became emotional upon being informed that she would need to perform an emergency landing with only two of the plane's three wheels. The pilot reportedly circled the strip for about 30 minutes until she felt comfortable and calm enough to land. Tarasca's mother and father, both of whom had ample flying experience, nervously watched from the ground below as their daughter approached the runway on which she'd been told to direct her landing. To assist in the teenage pilot's dangerous and nerve-wracking maneuver, the airport temporarily shut down so as to mitigate potential distractions. With help and support from her personal instructor, Tarasca was able to land the plane successfully without sustaining any injuries. Number 6. Nicole Moore In 2021, Nicole Moore's improbable story gained international attention after the woman revealed that she'd gotten pregnant nearly a decade prior, in spite of never having had intercourse. According to the 28-year-old supply teacher from Portsmouth, Hampshire, she suffered from a medical condition that precluded her from having intercourse or using certain conventional feminine care products. Moore and her boyfriend reportedly found alternative ways of being intimate with one another, which ultimately led to her unintentionally getting pregnant at the age of 18. After her story was widely disseminated on social media, Moore was playfully nicknamed Virgin Mary. The young woman detailed how she didn't officially lose her virginity until she was already five months pregnant, which she'd accomplished with the help of a physical therapist who'd reduced the severity of her condition. Number 5. The Russian First Time Flyer In July of 2017, a video surfaced online of a bloodied airplane passenger shouting hysterically and aggressively punching the seat in front of him. The viral clip was reportedly captured during a Red Wings flight from Moscow to Antalya, Turkey. According to the Russian news outlet Moscow24, it was the unidentified man's first time flying in an airplane, and he'd reportedly attempted to calm his nerves by consuming alcohol. He soon became unruly and frantic, however, and his drink was therefore confiscated by the flight crew. Enraged, the man then reportedly began pacing through the aisle of the cabin, demanding other travelers give him their alcoholic beverages. In an attempt to quell the frenzied passenger, flight attendants tried tying seatbelts around him to keep him restrained in his seat. The man resisted and in doing so forcefully hit his face on the back of the seat in front of him. In a later portion of the video, several other passengers were shown forcing the man to lie down while they restrained him with seatbelts. A traveler seated behind him also wrapped their arms around his neck to keep him seated. Upon the plane's arrival in Turkey, the belligerent passenger was taken into custody by local law enforcement. Although he and his family had taken the flight to Antalya for a holiday in the Turkish resort city, it was reported that they were immediately rerouted back to Russia following the plane's landing. Number 4. Jaime Alvarez Jaime Alvarez, a public defender from Santa Clara County, California, took a trip to Spain in July of 2019 to take part in the annual Running of the Bulls in Pamplona. During the first run of the San Fermín Festival on the 7th of the month, 46-year-old Alvarez reportedly ran most of the roughly 900-yard course. The pack of animals was then released and by the time Alvarez entered the bullfighting arena, they'd already caught up to him. Threatened by the raging bulls, he scaled a nearby fence for safety and waited until most of them had left the area to climb down. He then pulled out his cell phone in order to capture a selfie, which he wanted as a souvenir from his first visit to the famous Spanish festival. Before he could take the picture, however, Alvarez was trampled and gored by a charging bull that had strayed from the rest of the pack. The tourist later recounted how he didn't realize the extent or severity of his injuries until he touched his neck and his hand came away covered in blood. A bystander pulled Alvarez to safety and he was then transported to a regional hospital where he underwent a two-hour-long surgery. Doctors later detailed how the bull's horn had deeply penetrated Alvarez's neck and fractured his cheekbone. His jugular vein and major arteries were left untouched by the animal's charge, an aspect described to Alvarez as beyond miraculous. Number 3. Justice Boos On May the 4th of 2016, Justice Boos showed up for his first day as a gardener in Gilderland an affluent town in upstate New York. 
At some point during his inaugural shift, the 23-year-old father reportedly helped his colleagues at Countryside Tree Service remove several large trees from the front yard of a local home. As he was feeding tree fragments into a wood chipper, the inexperienced worker's hand became stuck in the machine and he was unable to dislodge it. Booz's entire body was then pulled into the chipper and he was killed. In the wake of the tragic accident, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration launched an official investigation into Booz's death. The federal agency ultimately determined that Tony Watson, the owner of Countryside Tree Service, had failed to properly train Booz and other employees on safely operating the company's dangerous power equipment. Watson consequently faced more than $141,000 in fines in connection to the incident. A GoFundMe page was created by Booz's friend with the intention of providing financial support to his fiancée. Number 2. Jennifer St. Clair At about 10 p.m. on December the 6th of 2018, Florida woman Jennifer St. Clair was picked up at her home by a man from New York and the two then went on a first date. In the early hours of the following day, St. Clair was reportedly riding on the back of her date's motorcycle as he traveled down Interstate 95 in Pompano Beach. According to West Palm Beach's WPBF-TV, St. Clair ended up falling off the bike and several bystanders would later report seeing a man standing by the 33-year-old's body on the side of the road before eventually fleeing the scene. A lawsuit filed by St. Clair's family alleged that the individual described by eyewitness testimonies was the man with whom she'd been on a date. The lawsuit accused him of abandoning the woman after realizing she was critically injured. Florida Highway Patrol officials reported that multiple drivers accidentally ran over the woman's body around 1.30 a.m. and she was ultimately found dead at about 3 a.m. The motorcycle rider later named as Miles McChesney was cleared of any wrongdoing following an official investigation by the Highway Patrol, and subsequent reports indicated it was unlikely he'd face criminal charges in connection to the incident. Number 1. Gianna Triplicata After graduating from high school in May of 2020, Gianna Triplicata planned a thrill-seeking outing with her grandmother at Skydive Atlanta, based at the Thomaston Upson County Airport in Georgia. The 18-year-old had long been considering skydiving and on July the 12th of that year, she followed through on her wish. On the day of her first ever jump, Triplicata was paired with an experienced skydiver named Nick Esposito, aged 35. As detailed in subsequent reports on the incident, their primary parachute failed to open properly during their mid-air descent. Upson County Sheriff Dan Kilgore later revealed that their emergency chute did ultimately deploy Unfortunately, the reserve had failed to open properly and the pair were already at a low altitude. Triplicata's parents, who'd gone to the airfield to witness her jump, noticed a diver spinning upside down in the distance. Unsure of whether the wayward jumper was their daughter, they reportedly got in their vehicle and sped towards the section of the airfield where they'd seen the botched landing occur. A sheriff's deputy was already at the scene, however, and he kept the teen's parents away from the diver, whom they learned was, in fact, their daughter. Both Triplicata and Esposito died at the scene following a devastating impact. The fatal incident was described as a freak accident in the wake of the two deaths, and the GoFundMe campaign was set up by family friends of the Triplicatas in order to help cover the cost of funeral expenses. Number 9. Philip Roberts In late January of 2015, at a 24-hour fitness facility in Irvine, Texas. A man randomly stabbed another gym goer while she was on the treadmill. Local authorities were first called to the gym after witnesses had noticed suspicious behavior from 32-year-old Philip Roberts, who was wearing a trench coat and carrying a suitcase. Roberts had been working out with a guest membership and regulars at the gym had seen him with his suitcase before. Another call was placed roughly 20 minutes after the first to report that Roberts had repeatedly stabbed a woman with a screwdriver, Justin Harper. A former police officer for the Blue Mound Police Department was working out only a few feet from where the attack had occurred. Roberts had approached the unnamed victim as she was walking on the treadmill and stabbed her in the back. Afterwards, both he and her fell in front of Harper's treadmill. The former officer and another gym goer tackled the attacker and held him to the ground. Harper later told a media outlet that he suspected Roberts had mental health issues, noting that he had a crazed, glazed-over look in his eyes. 
It was only after the police had arrived at the scene that Harper saw Roberts had a particularly dull Phillips head screwdriver with him. The victim was rushed to a Dallas hospital with three puncture wounds to her neck and back, from which she was reportedly left with a punctured lung. Fortunately, she wasn't described as being in life-threatening condition. According to Harper, whom the victim's husband thanked for his intervention, Roberts had told the police that the attack had simply popped into his head. He was charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon and held on a $100,000 bail. Number 8. Charles Lalonde In the summer of 2018, a video began circulating online of a teenager who was violently thrown out of a gym in Montreal, Canada for deadlifting too loudly. On August 2, Charles Lalonde, aged 19, had set up his phone to record himself as he pulled 350 pounds at the BuzzFit Center. He was planning on sending the footage to his trainer, but it ended up showing the altercation instead. As Lalonde was making his lift attempt, another man, wearing a tank top with the word ANIMAL printed on it, aggressively approached him. He stepped on Lalonde's barbell and pushed it down, causing the teenager to abruptly drop the heavyweight. The move could have resulted in Lalonde being seriously injured, and although he wasn't hurt, the video would show him wincing in the moments that followed. A heated exchange ensued in which the other man repeatedly told Lalonde, you're out, before pushing him into a wall. The teenager had reportedly been warned by gym staff in the past about his loud deadlifting, and told that he had to place shock-absorbing mats under the discs if he wanted to continue using the facility. He complied, but the other weightlifter, who wasn't reported as a BuzzFit worker, took it upon himself to kick him out. The video of the confrontation went viral in the aftermath and has been viewed over 9 million times on YouTube alone. Staff banned the unnamed aggressor from the gym while Lalonde was offered a year-long free membership to his dream gym in Montreal, SSP Barbell Club. Number 7. Essex Gym Altercation In November of 2019, a brutal fight erupted at a fitness centre in Essex, England, in which men battered each other using pieces of fitness equipment. It's unclear what led to the altercation, which was captured on video by another gym-goer at the Absolute Gym in Brentwood. The footage showed a group pinning a man wearing a blue tracksuit against the weight rack and striking him repeatedly in the head and body with metal bars. In a separate scene of the conflict, one gym goer raised the detached pull-down bar above his head and swung it at a rival involved in the melee. Perhaps the most shocking moment in the expletive-laden footage was of a man curled up on the floor in the fetal position and protecting his head with a disc weight as a brawler kicked him in the back and struck him with a dumbbell bar. None of those involved were identified, but a police report did mention that a man in his late teens suffered bruising and cuts while another, age 27, was left with a cut above his eye. Absolute described the fight as an isolated incident, reaffirmed its stance against violence, and mentioned that all of the men taking part in the row were banned for life. Number 6. Blythe Mason Boyle in March of 2019, shortly after leaving the NRJ Fitness Gym in Birmingham, England, a young woman was viciously attacked by a carjacker in his late teens. Blythe Mason Boyle, aged 24, had just finished her workout and was heading to her Audi A1 parked on Coventry Road, Sheldon. Majid Ali approached a woman and without provocation or warning, struck her in the head with a hammer. Before Mason Boyle could regain her composure, he drove off in her vehicle. The victim suffered cuts to her face and a shattered eye socket which resulted in permanent vision damage. Photos released by the police would show her with a severely swollen eye from which blood poured down to her chest. Mason Boyle would also need counselling in the aftermath to overcome the trauma of her ordeal. Local authorities were tipped off and identified Ali as the perpetrator, locating the Audi within 24 hours of the violent carjacking. The hammer used in the attack was found hidden underneath a sofa bed after a warrant was executed at his Spark Hill home. 18-year-old Ali denied charges of robbery, possession of an offensive weapon and wounding, but the police proved he'd been responsible and noted he felt no remorse over the attack. Ali was found guilty less than a year after the incident and was given a two-year and nine-year sentence to run concurrently. Number 5. Jaime Antonio Mesa Roughly five months after he and his girlfriend had broken up in 2018, Colombian man Jaime Antonio Mesa kept visiting the same gym as her in the city of Segovia. Mesa, who worked as a miner, reportedly hoped they'd reconcile the relationship, which had lasted for about 10 years prior to their separation. 
Surveillance footage would show them talking on a flight of stairs. The verbal exchange remained unclear, but it devolved into Messer pouncing on the unnamed woman and punching her in the face. He dragged her to the ground by her hair, whereupon his barrage of strikes persisted. Messer then attempted to flee up the stairs, but his ex-girlfriend charged after him and pulled him down, causing the man to fall onto his back on the bottom step. As they struggled on the gym floor, Meza once again ended up in top position and continued punching the woman with even greater force than in the altercation's earlier stage. Before leaving the room, he kicked his ex-girlfriend in the back of the head, then flung her across the room by her hair. According to updates on the matter, the woman was hospitalized in serious but stable condition, while the police had started looking to arrest Meza but still hadn't brought him into custody. Number 4. Incident in Mexico City in February of 2022, a harrowing surveillance video began circulating online of a woman who suffered a fatal accident at a gym in Mexico City. The unnamed 42-year-old was shown attempting to squat a barbell that had been loaded with approximately 400 pounds. The small-framed gym-goer lifted the weight, equivalent to that of a silverback gorilla, off the rack and for a few seconds appeared to be in control of it. She then started a downward motion, but her entire body buckled underneath the tremendous weight as her daughter and another weightlifter looked on in shock. She slumped to the ground with the barbell on her neck. Others in the gym rushed to her aid and lifted the weight off her, and the woman collapsed backwards unconscious. With blood pouring from her head, paramedics from the Red Cross subsequently pronounced the woman dead at the scene. The Mexico City Office of the Attorney General launched an investigation into the incident, but no further information was made available to the media as of early March 2022. Number 3. Christmas Abbott TV personality Christmas Abbott narrowly avoided serving a jail sentence following an incident outside a gym in Tampa, Florida in August of 2018. Abbott, who a year prior had finished third on the 19th season of Big Brother US, had recently found out that Benjamin Bunn, the father of her child, had been having an affair. The CrossFit star was eight months pregnant at the time, and she drove to the gym, which was owned by Bunn, to confront him and the alleged mistress named as Samantha Morse. Upon entering the facility, she started screaming at Bun while referring to Morse as a pathetic home wrecker and threw a nice coffee across the room. Once outside, she got into her Mercedes-Benz SUV and rammed Morse's car multiple times. When an officer arrived at the scene, Abbott began crying and confessed to have lost it and crashed her Benz into the car because its owner had been allegedly sleeping with her child's father. Due to the advanced state of her pregnancy, the arresting officers didn't take her into custody, but issued a warrant that would allow Abbott to turn herself in after she gave birth. On October the 8th, about a month after her son was born, the TV personality faced the legal consequences of her car-smashing rampage and was charged with felony criminal mischief. Following a plea agreement, she was sentenced to 12 months probation and 25 hours of community service ordered to pay $1,357.95 in restitution and complete an anger management class. Number 2. Roseville LA Fitness Row In March of 2014, a mass brawl, the quelling of which required the intervention of local authorities, erupted at an LA fitness gym in Roseville, Minnesota. The fighting had reportedly started out on the basketball court before spilling into the fitness area where four men had chased another. 10 to 15 men, some of whom attempted to defuse the situation, were ultimately involved in the altercation. The man that the group of four had been chasing was directed by the LA fitness manager to stay by the front desk and juice bar. Police Lieutenant Lorne Rosend told a media outlet that the others then started throwing two and a half, five and 10 pound weights at the bar and their male target. They also used barbells and a trash can lid as projectiles in their onslaught. Police officers were successful in tempering the situation and six men were taken into custody. Three were identified as Minneapolis residents Ali Yusuf Bari and Abdi Rashid Yassin Duad, both 18, and Burnsville man Mohammed Awil Suleiman, aged 20. They were charged with disorderly conduct and participation in a riot. The LA Fitness location had been plagued with crime in recent years. In 2013, Roseville police responded to 147 incidents at the gym, and in 2014, officers had already been called two dozen times in the months leading up to the mass brawl. Number 1. Samuel Kiwaz On March the 19th, at an Anytime Fitness location in Culver City, California, a man was knocked off his treadmill after an SUV plowed through the floor-to-ceiling glass window near him. The victim, Samuel Kiwaz, would later report 
It's a miracle that I'm alive. He'd been warming up on a treadmill in preparation for a group fitness class. As the Mercedes SUV came crashing through the window, it made contact with Kiwaz's treadmill and launched him off it, also sending a multitude of glass shards in his direction. Kiwaz flew back into a door which opened as he hit it, saving him from further injuries as the treadmills were pushed into the walls by the crashing vehicle. An employee helped into his feet, wiping blood from his face and mouth. The female driver of the SUV, who'd allegedly experienced a failure of the brakes on her vehicle, also got out to check if Kiwaz was all right but then attempted to leave. She was stopped from fleeing by an off-duty officer working out at the gym and later interviewed by the authorities. Number 7. Brawl in Perth In December of 2021, a massive brawl broke out during a screening of Spider-Man No Way Home at the Hoyt Cinema in the Karen Yup Shopping Centre of Perth, Australia. The authorities were still investigating the incident as of the latest updates on the matter, but the row which was captured on video was reported to have commenced as security guards attempted to remove a man from the theatre. He was allegedly part of a group that had been causing a disturbance by yelling profanities and throwing items at other moviegoers. The melee, which sprawled out into the aisles, ultimately came to involve at least 10 people with other audience members gathering to watch it unfold. A security guard was injured as a result but declined an ambulance. Two men aged 19 and 20 were each charged with endangering the life, health or safety of a person and disorderly conduct. Hoyts released a statement condemning the behavior of the group, who'd incited the brawl and claiming that they'd be permanently banned. Number 6. Attempted Murder of Adam Lucero 21-year-old Adam Lucero of Pasadena, California was watching The Shallows at a movie theater in Santa Rosa in late June of 2016. In an unexpected and unprovoked attack, the man sitting behind him in the darkened theater began stabbing him repeatedly with a large chef's knife. The assailant would be later identified as Delonte Hart, aged 23. Lucero reportedly fought for his life and struggled to repel Hart's onslaught. The attacker fled the theater and other moviegoers tended to Lucero as they waited for an ambulance. He was left in critical condition, having suffered a punctured lung and injuries to his neck, arm and ear. Lucero was hospitalized for two weeks and the stabbing wound to his throat damaged his voice box, slurring his speech. He could barely walk and suffered from post-traumatic stress in the aftermath. The police found the knife at the scene, the make and model of which they traced to a Macy's store. More gruesome revelations followed. After shoplifting the knife and three days before attacking Lucero, Hart had killed Sirac Mateos Tesfazi, aged 22, on Riley Street. The man had been camped out on the street and Hart stabbed him at least 50 times with a knife identical to the one found in a trash can at the movie theater. Hart was identified through surveillance footage and arrested. Investigators found Tesfazi's blood on his clothing and also lifted his fingerprints from the murder weapon. Hart was initially found mentally unfit to stand trial and sent to Napa State Hospital. Once his competence was restored, his trial was set in motion and he pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and attempted murder in November of 2018. He was given 15 years to life for the former and 12 years for the latter, sentences that were to be served consecutively, not concurrently. Number 5. Murder of Anthony Barajas and Kylie Goodrich on July the 26th of 2021, TikTok influencer Anthony Barajas, aged 19, was on a first date with 18-year-old Kylie Goodrich at a movie theater in Corona, California. They had dinner and at 9.35 went to see The Forever Purge, a movie about a national holiday in which all criminal activity, including murder, is legal for a day. Aside from the two teens, there was only a group of four young men in the theater, one of whom was 20-year-old Joseph Jimenez. His friends ultimately left because Jimenez was acting strangely reportedly by mumbling and talking to himself and after he'd led them to believe that he was armed. Only he, Barajas and Goodrich remained in the theater. During the movie, he shot both teens in the head, execution style, at point-blank range. They sustained critical gunshot injuries and were found by cleaning staff at around 11.35 p.m. Goodrich, a student at Grand Canyon University, was pronounced dead at the scene while Barajas was put on a life support and ultimately passed away a few days later. Jimenez had no prior connection to his victims and the shooting was determined to have been completely random. Riverside County Sheriff's deputies tracked him down through the friend who'd bought the movie tickets. Upon their arrival at his home, a trailer in El Cerrito, deputies saw Jimenez yelling and waving a gun. They took him into custody without incident and determined that his weapon matched the caliber of slugs found at the crime scene. Mental illness was reported as a factor in the shooting as Jimenez 
a schizophrenia sufferer who hadn't been taking his medication, told the media he'd heard voices in his head, telling him his loved ones would be killed if he didn't shoot the teens. He was charged with murder and a special circumstance of lying in wait that made him eligible for the death penalty. Number 4. Atik Rafiq Englishman Atik Rafiq and his wife Aisha Sada went to Birmingham's Star City Cinema on March the 9th of 2019. The 24-year-old bought seats in gold class for Screen 17 and at some point during the movie couldn't find his keys and phone. He knelt down and began searching for them with the seat's motorized footrest in a raised position. Rafiq went under the seat in a footrest, then automatically started lowering on his neck. An engineering expert later performed tests on the chair and determined that the father of one's neck had been compressed with roughly three quarters of a ton of pressure. Sada tried to stop the footrest but couldn't identify the buttons to operate it. Ten to fifteen minutes had passed before the movie goer was released, at which point he turned blue and was in critical condition. Rafiq died at Heartlands Hospital on March the 16th after suffering a catastrophic lack of oxygen to his brain. An inquest was carried out and the cinema was fined over a million dollars in 2021 after admitting to have failed in assessing the risks associated with the motorized chair. A judge described it as an accident that never should have happened and the court was told that the reclining chair had been missing a bar that would have allowed Rafiq to be freed manually. Number 3. Kerry Carmen. In 2018, a woman and her father were charged with endangering the welfare of a child following an incident in which the former had dumped her popcorn on a stranger's toddler. 25-year-old Kerry Carmen and her father Charles, aged 61, were watching Star Wars The Last Jedi at a theater in Long Island, New York on January 2nd. Sitting next to Carmen was Celia Riggs and her two-year-old daughter Harley. At one point during the PG-13 movie, Harley asked her mother for some popcorn. As later reported by Riggs, her child had barely uttered the word when Carmen clamped her hand around Harley's mouth and then dumped her $8.99 popcorn container on the child's head. Carmen's aggressive outburst also reportedly involved her cursing at 28-year-old Riggs. The mother ran out with her child after she'd started crying while Carmen and her father left in the meantime. Riggs then took to social media to share the incident and ask for help towards identifying those involved. The police were able to track them down through surveillance footage and ticket receipts. In March, Carmen was taken into custody and charged, as was her father, for not stopping the incident. Number 2. Shooting in Lafayette 59-year-old John Russell Hauser went to a screening of Trainwreck at the Grand 16 Movie Theatre in Lafayette, Louisiana on the evening of July the 23rd of 2015. Surveillance footage would show him calmly buying a ticket. Ten minutes late into the movie, Hauser briefly sat in the second-to-last row before he got up and brandished a high-point model JCP 40 caliber pistol. He started shooting indiscriminately, with his first victims being the people who had been sitting directly in front of him. Hauser continued firing his weapon as he walked down the stairs, ultimately letting off at least 13 shots and reloading once. He exited the theater through a side door and tried heading for his vehicle by blending with survivors. By then, the police had already made their way to the scene after receiving frantic calls, which were later made public from people trapped inside the building. Hauser noticed the presence of law enforcement and returned to the building where he fired three more shots at the fleeing moviegoers. He then took his life by discharging the pistol into his mouth. 21-year-old Macy Bro and Gillian Johnson, aged 33, sustained fatal gunshot wounds as a result of Hauser's rampage, while nine others were injured, either by gunfire or through accidents sustained while trying to escape the theater. Investigators later searched a Motel 6 where the Georgia-born shooter had been staying and found disguises suggesting that he'd planned to flee in the shooting's aftermath. A definitive motive wasn't established, but it was found that Hauser had a history of mental illness and held controversial opinions on race, gender, and government, expressed during his online activity. Number 1. Aurora Movie Theater Shooting On July the 20th of 2012, several hundred people gathered in Theater 6 of the Cinema 16 Multiplex in Aurora, Colorado for a midnight screening of The Dark Knight Rises. Roughly 20 minutes into the Batman movie, James Egan Holmes exited the theater through an emergency door. At 12.30 a.m., he returned to Theater 6 heavily armed and armored. He was equipped with a load-bearing vest, a ballistic helmet, and a gas mask in addition to a bulletproof throat guard, a groin protector, and bulletproof leggings. Moviegoers initially thought he was part of a prank, 
a publicity stunt for the movie's premiere, or that he was simply in costume, as many of those in attendance were at the time. 24-year-old Holmes, who was reportedly listening to techno music in his headphones to drown out what was to come, then threw a gas canister obstructing the moviegoer's vision, while also irritating their throats, skin and eyes. He then fired a 12-gauge pump-action shotgun, first into the ceiling and then into the crowd. Holmes also shot an AR-15-style semi-automatic rifle with a 100-round drum magazine, but it eventually jammed, prompting him to switch to a 40 caliber Glock 22 pistol. As the shooting unfolded, Holmes concentrated his fire to the back of the room and then to those in the aisles. Three people in the adjacent Theater 8, which was showing the same movie, were also hit when a bullet pierced through the wall. Through his combined use of the three weapons, Holmes had fired 76 shots, causing 58 people to sustain bullet-related injuries. Twelve of them ultimately passed away, including four men in their 20s, who died at the scene reportedly while protecting their girlfriends from the gunfire. In the aftermath, one victim became a paraplegic and another suffered extensive brain damage from a shotgun blast to the head and was left unable to speak or move properly. Law enforcement rushed to the scene and arrived less than two minutes after the first calls had been placed. Holmes was apprehended without incident next to his car behind the cinema. Experts identified Holmes' mental illness, schizoaffective disorder, as a significant factor behind the massacre, but he was deemed to have been legally sane at the time of the shooting. Prosecutors sought the death penalty, but the jury who found Holmes guilty on multiple counts of murder and attempted murder couldn't unanimously agree on it. The mass murderer was sentenced to 12 consecutive life sentences, plus 3,318 years without parole. Number 7. Rick Moranis Actor Rick Moranis, who starred in several successful movies including Ghostbusters, Honey, I Shrunk, The Kids and The Flintstones, was randomly attacked in Manhattan, New York City on October the 1st of 2020. The incident was captured by surveillance cameras and it showed the 67-year-old getting sucker punched and knocked to the ground by a man wearing an I Love New York hoodie. Moranis was left with minor injuries to his head, back and hip from which he eventually recovered. He took himself to the hospital and later reported the assault to the NYPD, which then released footage of it as part of their effort to identify the suspect. He would later be named as Marquis Ventura, aged 35. It was deemed unlikely that Moranis had been targeted because of his celebrity status, as he'd been wearing a face mask at the time and Ventura also had a history of assaulting strangers. A reported sufferer of paranoid schizophrenia, who hadn't been taking his medication, had been to psych wards in seven different states. Prior to being arrested over a six-month period, Ventura had carried out five separate attacks. Hours after punching Moranis, he stole a bottle of champagne from a Soho bodega and then pummeled the owner, who had confronted him about the theft. Number 6. Dana Vulin Australian woman Dana Vulin was set on fire in February of 2012 by a woman who was under the mistaken belief that she was involved with her partner. Vulin, then 25 years old, had met Natalie Dimitrovska's estranged husband just once at a party, and they'd only had a brief conversation nevertheless. Dimitrovska became convinced that the pair were having an affair and for weeks would call Vulin and threaten to murder her. While under the influence of amphetamines, the jealous wife and a companion, Daniel Stone, went to Vulin's Perth apartment complex. Dimitrovska broke into the home through a balcony, confronted Vulin and demanded to know her husband's whereabouts. As tensions escalated and while Vulin was holding a lamp with an open flame, Dimitrovska doused her with a bottle of methylated spirit. Looking back on the attack, Vulin remembered that suddenly the whole world was on fire. Flames engulfed her body from the waist up and she could hear Dimitrovska and Stone laughing at her before fleeing through a side door. She dropped and rolled, but in doing so, only spread the fire further around her torso. Desperate, Vulin went to the sink and poured a bucket of water on her body. She remembered that skin was falling from her fingers. As she then stumbled into the hallway screaming for help, Vulin was eventually found by Dennis Erickson, a man who lived in another building, who called the emergency services and whom she credited with saving her life. Over 60% of Vulin's body, including her face, arms and midsection, was covered in horrific third-degree burns, and the woman was in a coma for two days. She underwent over 200 procedures in the aftermath and documented her painful recovery in a book called Worth Fighting For. Its cover would show the extent of the damage Vulin had suffered as it displayed her partially naked and extensively scarred body. The woman reported that one of the worst aspects of her recovery was wearing a compression mask, which held her face together for roughly two years and eight months. Dimitrovska was arrested at the airport, 
while trying to flee the country to Macedonia and subsequently sentenced to 17 years in prison for the attack. Number 5. Cutty Banks 30-year-old rapper Melota Lassie, professionally known as Cutty Banks, was gunned down in December of 2020 outside a Wells Fargo branch in San Mateo, California. Banks was ambushed by Isaiah Rupina, aged 34, who'd plotted to hit alongside a woman named Amanda Young. They were the brother and girlfriend of the late Louis Lucci Rupina, who'd been shot and killed while driving on the 405 freeway in Seal Beach in August of the same year. Young and Rapina had conducted what the authorities dubbed a street investigation, at the conclusion of which the former pointed to Lassie as her boyfriend's killer. The woman, reported as being in her late 20s at the time, believed that the shooting had been the result of a previous confrontation between Lassie and the younger Rupina at a marijuana dispensary in Compton. She convinced the deceased brother that Lassie had been responsible, and he planned the retaliatory shooting by tracking the rapper's movements through social media. He lay in wait and fired five bullets into Lassie's body, who was subsequently pronounced dead at the scene, then fled in a white Mercedes. The car would prove instrumental in identifying Rupina, as the culprit and in the spring of 2021, both he and Young were arrested on murder charges. An investigation carried out by the California Highway Patrol concluded that the latter had been mistaken in accusing Lassie. The rapper hadn't been involved in the shooting of Louis Rupina, which had actually been a result of road rage, meaning that he'd been gunned down for doing nothing. Number 4. Jade Matua In August of 2019, a woman was killed in West London after being run over by a police officer that was driving more than twice the speed limit. On the 13th of the month, social studies student Jade Matua, aged 22, was waiting for her boyfriend in Warwick Road, Kensington. Police Constable Gary Watkinson was driving a police car at a reported 64 miles per hour in an area where the limit was 30 miles per hour. Matua, described as a beautiful and innocent young woman by her family, was struck and suffered devastating injuries. She was left with a brain injury as well as a broken back, neck, ruptured pelvis, and broken leg. Paramedics were able to revive her at the scene, but she was taken off life support two days after the incident at St. Mary's Hospital. An inquest was launched into the deadly collision to determine if the police vehicle was responding to an emergency at the time, thus justifying the speed under which Watkinson was driving it. The case is ongoing as of 2021 and the victim's family have yet to receive concrete answers, with progress being delayed by the pandemic. But a preliminary police investigation found no indication that the officer had been operating the cruiser improperly. Number 3. Chad Gordon in May of 2020 at a home in North London, a man was fatally shot in the head in a revenge hit that was carried out at the wrong address. Mason Sani Semedo, aged 19, and 20-year-old Cameron Robinson traveled to Chad Gordon's Tottenham home on May the 18th. Gordon, an autistic man described as a gentle giant by loved ones, answered the door. Upon doing so, one of the men shot him in the head with a 9mm handgun. 27-year-old Gordon collapsed and family members rushed to his aid, but he was beyond saving. The bullet had gone through his face and become lodged in his skull. Sani Semedo and Robinson held Gordon's aunt at gunpoint before fleeing. It subsequently emerged that a friend of theirs had been stabbed to death five days prior to the shooting and they'd gone to the wrong address where they suspected the killer lived. They mistakenly believed Gordon had been responsible, but had never been linked to any criminal activity. He attended a local Bruce Grove youth club for people with learning difficulties and was reported as shy and non-confrontational. Leading up to the attack, surveillance footage had captured Sani Semedo and Robinson driving on the streets, which weren't particularly crowded due to recent lockdown restrictions. After the shooting, they burnt the moped in Walthamstow marshes, but were ultimately tracked down by law enforcement. It took a jury less than a full day to find them guilty of murder, for which they were sentenced to a minimum of 29 years in prison. Number 2. Randy Rodriguez Santos's Killing Spree in a rampage across Chinatown in New York City's Manhattan borough, an attacker used a metal pipe to bludgeon to death four homeless men in their sleep. The horrific killing spree occurred on October the 5th of 2019, and the perpetrator was identified as 24-year-old Randy Rodriguez Santos, who was also reported as being homeless at the time. After 1 a.m. while wielding a 15-pound metal pipe, he began striking people in the head as they slept repeatedly and in quick succession. The attacks, as the authorities later reported, were completely random. Three of the victims were found on East Broadway, while another was found on the Bowery. 
They ranged in ages from 48 to 83 and one of the attacks was captured by surveillance cameras. There were also at least two victims who survived the brutal bludgeoning and witnesses alerted the authorities. The police found Rodriguez Santos shortly after the incident had been reported walking near Canal Street. He was still carrying the murder weapon which by that point had fresh blood and hair on it. He was taken into custody and after a psychiatric evaluation at Bellevue Hospital, charged with murder and attempted murder. Number 1. Knockout Game The knockout game, a violent trend the frequency of which has reportedly seen an increase in the context of social media, involves sucker punching an unsuspecting victim in an attempt to render them unconscious with a single blow. The attacker will often be accompanied by accomplices who would film the punch and then post it online. There have been several incidents in which the knockout game, also known as Knockout King, has resulted in severe injuries and even death. 72-year-old Vietnamese immigrant Huang Nguyen was walking home with his wife after a trip to the market in St. Louis, Missouri in April of 2011. Four teenagers, who'd allegedly been playing the game, approached the couple. Nguyen felt the threat and stepped in front of his wife to protect her. 18-year-old Alex Murphy broke away from the group, grabbed Nguyen's shirt and punched him with such force that he collapsed to the ground. The man later succumbed to blunt force trauma and Murphy was sentenced to life in prison, plus 25 years. In July of 2012, in West Roger Park, Chicago, Guatemalan man Delfino Mora was killed in similar fashion. Nicholas Ayala, Anthony Malcolm and Malik Jones were charged in connection to the incident and sentenced to 27, 30 and 33 years in prison respectively for murder and robbery. They were identified after the former uploaded a video of the attack to Facebook. As Malcolm was filming, Jones punched Mora in the jaw causing him to fall, hit his head on the concrete and suffer a catastrophic injury. Jones then took $60 from his wallet before he and the others abandoned him in the street. Mora, a father of 12 who had been collecting aluminium cans to provide for his family, died the following day. Number 8. Jeff Bush A 37-year-old Florida man was swallowed alive by a sinkhole on February the 28th of 2013 as he slept at his home in Sefna, roughly 15 miles east of downtown Tampa. Looking back on the incident, Jeremy Bush remembered hearing his brother, 36-year-old Jeff, shouting from his room. As Jeremy ran in, all he could see was a massive hole that had opened up where his brother's bed had been. He jumped to his rescue through the opening as the floor was crumbling and dirt was still going down but couldn't reach him. A deputy later pulled Jeremy out of the hole, saving his life. Unfortunately, Jeff couldn't be rescued and subsequent analysis showed no signs of life in the sinkhole, prompting officials to abandon their search for him. The man's body was never recovered. Shortly before the home was demolished, a contractor released photos of the hole that had claimed Jeff's life. Because of the land's instability, the houses on each side were also reportedly condemned. Sinkholes typically open up when the foundation beneath the first layer of earth becomes cavernous due to erosion, either naturally occurring or influenced by man-made activities such as groundwater pumping and construction. A specialist from a geology consulting firm noted that there's virtually no area in Florida that's immune to sinkholes and that it's difficult to predict where they'll occur. Over two years since Jeff's death, after the area had been fenced off, the earth again opened up into a 20-foot deep hole in the same spot, but no locals were hurt or evacuated. Number 7. Carlitha Foley On September the 26th of 2021, actress Carlitha Foley was found unresponsive by her teenage son at her apartment in Atlanta, Georgia. Foley, whose credits include blood and water, choose this day and behind closed doors, had been shot in the head while she was sleeping. The authorities discovered a bullet hole in the apartment's wall and determined that Foley had been shot through it, based on the projectile's trajectory. Investigators found that the actress's neighbor, 22-year-old Maxwell Williamson, had been cleaning his handgun but forgot that he'd left the round in the chamber. The weapon discharged, causing the bullet to pierce through the wall and fatally strike Foley in the head. Williamson, unaware of her death, had reportedly left a note on the victim's door apologizing for the damage. He was arrested and held without bond on charges of involuntary manslaughter and reckless conduct. Number 6. Duncan Lemp Maryland man Duncan Socrates Lemp, aged 21, was shot dead by police carrying out a raid at his Potomac home on March the 12th of 2021. Lemp, a student and software developer, was associated with the Three Percenters, a paramilitary anti-government militia. He was part of the Boogaloo movement, the followers of which have been described as being expectants or inciters 
of a second American Revolution or another civil war. A SWAT team conducted a no-knock search warrant. After the authorities had received reports, Lemp was in possession of firearms, which was allegedly prohibited by his criminal past as a juvenile. Two versions of the March 12th shooting occurred in the months that followed, only one of which was backed by the testimony of a non-involved witness. The official report claimed that after the SWAT team had made their way into the home, Lemp had refused to comply with their orders to show his hands and get on the ground. He was shot, according to the authorities, upon attempting to confront the tactical operators with a rifle near his bedroom door. Leading up to the fatal incident, Lemp had been sleeping next to his pregnant girlfriend, Casey Robinson, who wasn't harmed in the raid. According to a witness report, the SWAT team had started firing and throwing flashbangs through the window before entering the house. Through their attorney, Lemp's family maintained that he'd actually been gunned down in his sleep and that law enforcement had issued no verbal commands upon making their way inside. Robinson was reportedly forced to remain in the same room with Lemp for up to an hour after he'd been killed. Three rifles and two handguns were recovered from the home and following an investigation, no officers were charged for the shooting. In spite of multiple requests, neither body camera footage nor the arrest warrant was released by the Montgomery County Police Department. It was eventually sued towards that end by the conservative activist group Judicial Watch. Once the videos were made available, they only showed the aftermath of the shooting, not the act itself. Lemp was regarded as a martyr by the Boogaloo movement with phrases like We are Duncan Lemp or His name was Duncan Lemp, adopted and reportedly repeated like mantras by its adherents. Number 5. Crystal Rodriguez on January the 11th of 2021, a college student sleeping in her bed in Dallas, Texas suffered fatal injuries following what local police suspected had been a random shooting. The victim was identified as 18-year-old Crystal Rodriguez, who attended classes at Texas A&M Commerce and was working towards becoming a flight attendant. She'd returned home to help her mother look after her two younger siblings. The shooter opened fire at around 2.30 a.m. from a vehicle that was reportedly captured on video. A bullet entered the home through the kitchen window and fatally struck Rodriguez, who was sleeping in the next room. The teenager's grieving mother recounted how she'd found her on the floor with blood pooling around her. She was rushed to the hospital where she ultimately passed away from her injuries. During a press conference, Dallas Police Chief Eddie Garcia had strong words regarding the drive-by shooting, which he claimed that he and the department took personal. He described its perpetrators as cowards that have no respect for human life. As of late January of 2021, no suspects had been named in connection to Rodriguez's death. Number 4. Matthew Wilson British astrophysicist Matthew Wilson, aged 31, was shot while sleeping next to his girlfriend at an apartment complex in Atlanta, Georgia in mid-January of 2021. Wilson, from Surrey, England, was in the US visiting his California-born partner of three years, Kim Shepard. Wilson was supposed to be in the country for several months after a period in which he and Shepard had maintained their relationship long distance. In what the police described as a senseless act, the man was shot within roughly a week of his arrival in the neighborhood of Bookhaven. Leading up to the tragic incident, over 30 gunshot sounds were heard in the area. The round traveled approximately 260 yards through a small forest, pierced the bedroom wall of Shepard's home and struck the postdoctoral scientific researcher in the head. Shepard held him in her arms for 20 minutes while waiting for the emergency services, and she heard more shots ring out in the meantime. Wilson was rushed to a local trauma center, but his life couldn't be saved. While no suspects were identified in the immediate aftermath, police reported that a group in a nearby apartment block on Buford Highway had been participating in the reckless discharge of firearms. Number 3. Incident in Eureka In May of 2021, a Chevrolet Malibu crashed through the roof of a home in Eureka, St. Louis County, Missouri. The vehicle had been driven down the Legends Parkway when it careened off the road and made contact with a pine tree. It then began rolling down an embankment, crashed through an iron fence and became airborne before nose diving into the roof. A couple were sleeping only 10 feet away from where the car impacted the master bedroom of their Thorn Tree Lane home. None of the identities of those involved were released, but remarkably, there were no major injuries reported for the couple or for the Malibu's occupants, only identified as two teenagers. They were able to get themselves out of the vehicle while the homeowners, who'd awoken in a panic, had to put out a small fire in their garden. Firefighters and the police were called to the address shortly before 2 a.m. It's unclear what legal consequences the Malibu's driver suffered as a result of the crash. Talking to the media in the aftermath, a spokesman for the fire department expressed bewilderment that no one had died in the accident. Number 2. Montana Woman's Vehicular Rampage 
In January of 2020, Mercedes K. Shellhard, aged 25, lost control of her car while under the influence of alcohol and crashed into the side of a house. The incident occurred in Black Eagle, Montana and began with Shellhart backing out of a driveway near the intersection of 23rd Street, Northeast and Chicago Avenue. She first struck a parked pickup truck with her Jeep and then accelerated, hitting a golf cart. Shellhart proceeded to drive through a fence and shrubs prior to crossing the lawn and plowing through a neighboring home. The front of the Jeep impacted the post of an elevated bed awakening an unnamed woman and her child. Aside from it being a terrifying experience, no serious injuries were reported. Responding officers noticed that Shell Hart exhibited signs of inebriation, including bloodshot and glassy eyes, swaying and stuttered speech. A preliminary breathalyzer test revealed that she was more than twice over the legal limit, with a blood alcohol concentration of 0.171. She was arrested on the felony charge of criminal endangerment and for the driving under the influence in addition to the charge of driving without a valid license, as hers had been expired for 54 months. Number 1. Gilbert De Leon In May of 2015, Missouri man Gilbert De Leon was at the James River, southwest of Nixa, with his girlfriend, Shelly Johns. At one point during their day out, as De Leon was wading through the river, he shouted to Johns that he'd been bitten by a snake. He then got out of the water and noticed that he had a bite mark on each leg, most likely from a venomous cotton mouth. Later in the day, the 37-year-old began feeling lethargic, but in spite of Johns' pleas, refused to go to the hospital. The couple went to bed and the woman would later recall that De Leon was snoring much louder than usual, a potential indicator that he'd begun struggling to breathe properly. The following morning, when Johns woke up, she found her boyfriend lying dead beside her. The authorities found no evidence in the house to suspect the death was caused by anything but a snake bite, an aspect that was subsequently confirmed by a coroner. Number 8. Unnamed New Jersey Woman In June of 2017, a woman was distracted by her cell phone and fell through open doors in the sidewalk on a street in Plainfield, New Jersey. As shown by surveillance footage that was widely circulated online, the unnamed 67-year-old woman was looking at her phone while walking down Somerset Street towards one of two basement access doors. According to the police, they'd been left open due to a gas line repair that was being performed in the area. The woman ran into the door then fell over it nearly six and a half feet into the basement. She was helped by workers and subsequently taken to the hospital, but her injuries were reported as non-life-threatening. Her son, who also chose to remain nameless, told a media outlet that the woman was legally blind and a diabetic. He reported feeling fortunate that she hadn't been killed in the fall, while also mentioning that she had been feeling ill and had briefly checked the time on her phone prior to plummeting through the opening. Number 7. Rianne Mayfield a woman from Chesterfield, Virginia was left with a two-inch gash in her forehead after she was struck by a cell phone while on a roller coaster in 2018. On June the 10th, Rianne Mayfield was riding the Twisted Timbers attraction at the King's Dominion Amusement Park for the first time. She suddenly saw a black object flying towards her but couldn't identify what it was before she felt the impact of it hitting her in the head. Mayfield then felt something warm cover her face which she quickly came to realize was blood. She could reportedly tell by the reactions of those around her that her injury was severe. Mayfield had been struck in the forehead by a cell phone which a man on the roller coaster had failed to properly secure in his pocket. The speed of the ride had turned the loose item into a dangerous projectile. The device's owner reportedly came up to Mayfield and apologized in the immediate aftermath, but she didn't get his name in the commotion, and it's unclear if he faced any legal repercussions for the incident. The woman received several stitches to her forehead and was left with a permanent scar following a painful recovery process that included weeks of headaches. A spokeswoman for the amusement park claimed that there were signs in place informing prospective riders that all loose articles must be fully secured at all times or stored. Mayfield was subsequently reimbursed for her season pass to the park and new signs were placed in front of the Twisted Timbers stating that absolutely no cell phones were permitted on it. Number 6. Rosemary Ann Charsky the Washington County Sheriff's Office in Oregon told the media outlet that their first shooting call of 2020 had come only minutes into the new decade at 12.06 a.m. Rosemary Ancharski of Bethany was subsequently taken into custody for shooting into her neighbor's bedroom. The 35-year-old woman, who was seen smiling in one of her processing photos, had reportedly accidentally discharged a handgun into her smartphone. 
The bullet cut clean through the device, rendering it inoperable, and then through Anchaski's wall before ending up in her neighbor's apartment. Fortunately, no one was hurt, as the room was empty at the time. Anchaski's bail was set at $1,000 after she was charged with recklessly endangering an unlawful use of a weapon. It's unclear what she'd been doing leading up to the shooting, but based on the bullet's trajectory, deputies believed she'd been holding the cell phone in a selfie-like position. The authorities also suspected intoxicants had been a factor in the incident. Number 5. Natasha Boggs On May the 28th of 2017, an Ohio woman who was allegedly distracted while driving plowed into three teenagers after losing control of her car. 24-year-old Natasha Boggs, whose son was in the back seat of her 1999 Ford Escort, drifted over the fog line on South Main Street in Coventry Township. She struck the teenagers who were reportedly walking along the stretch of the road which didn't have sidewalks. Amber Toma of Coventry Township and Taylor Galloway of Akron were both killed in a crash, while a teenage boy suffered broken bones and severe head injuries. Boggs tried to help them in the immediate aftermath. According to prosecutors, she later returned to her car and began deleting text messages off her cell phone. The case against her was largely built around the idea that she'd been texting and driving. While the evidence didn't directly confirm that accusation, it was clear that she'd sent and received texts prior to the 911 call she'd placed. Boggs denied texting behind the wheel and claimed that she'd actually been distracted by her son. While booked at the Summit County Jail, however, she told her mother that she might have fallen asleep. The woman had taken prescribed methadone earlier in the day, but investigators reported that she hadn't been under the influence. Boggs eventually pleaded guilty in March of 2018 to two counts of involuntary manslaughter, one count of vehicular assault, and one count of attempted tampering with evidence. She was sentenced to six years in prison. Number 4. Fire on Air Canada Flight In 2018, a passenger's phone caught fire while it was charging on an Air Canada flight from Toronto to Vancouver. The aircraft had not yet taken off from Pearson International Airport when the incident occurred. Passengers at the front saw black smoke rising from a few rows back and before long, a number of people on the aircraft began screaming and jumping out of their seats. Talking to CTV Toronto, passenger Brandon Scott described the fire as a small campfire-sized flame. The crew was able to put it out while firefighters were called to investigate and clear the scene ultimately delaying the flight for over two hours. The unnamed woman whose phone had erupted in flames suffered first-degree burns but was able to walk off the aircraft unassisted. Kathy Boot, another passenger, would report that she'd seen her attempt to stomp out the fire. The make and model of the cell phone wasn't specified, but the incident is believed to have been sparked by manufacturing defects in its lithium-ion battery. Number 3. Anjanette Marie Massette Florida woman Anjanette Marie Massette sparked outrage in May of 2018 through her mugshot, which showed her widely grinning after she'd instigated a car crash that would ultimately result in a woman's death while driving her 2011 Chevrolet Avalon on US Highway 27 in Orlando. Missette failed to brake in time and smashed into a Hyundai Elantra. The second car was being driven by 18-year-old Cheyenne Kroll and 60-year-old Sandra Clarkson, her mother was in the passenger seat. The powerful impact sandwiched the Elantra between the tractor trailer in front of it and the Avalon, which had rear-ended it. Kroll walked away with minor injuries, but Clarkson was left in critical condition. She was rushed to the Orlando Regional Medical Center, where she underwent several surgeries. The woman ultimately passed away three days later after being rendered paralyzed and brain-dead by the collision. By her own admission, Misset had lost control of her car because she had been distracted after dropping her cell phone. Additionally, her blood alcohol was found to have been double the legal limit. The woman's smiling mugshot went viral and many, including Clarkson's grieving family, argued that it displayed Misset's complete lack of remorse for her actions. After the woman's charges were upgraded to manslaughter, a new mugshot was taken, showing her with a grimmer expression. She ultimately apologized in court to the victim's family, pleaded no contest and was sentenced to 11 years in prison. Number 2. Evgenia Shulatieva 26-year-old Russian woman Evgenia Shulatieva succumbed to a massive electric shock in September of 2019 in an accident involving a cell phone. Shulatieva's lifeless body was found by her mother, Vera, in the bathroom of her home in the town of kirova chipetsk Vera had become worried after failing to reach her daughter on the phone. An investigation determined that while the young woman was taking a bath, 
Her cell phone had fallen into the tub. It's unclear if Shulatieva had been using it at the time, but the device was connected to a charger and plugged in an outlet. As explained by Yuri Agrafonov, head of the radio electronic department of Irkut State University, water is a good conductor which allowed the current to pass from the 220 volt outlet and cause a short circuit. On their own, cell phones operate on voltages that are generally considered too low to pose a danger. Shulatieva died of electrocution within minutes of the charging device making contact with the water. Her passing was another in a series of similar incidents which had recently occurred in Russia, including the death of prominent poker player Lilia Novikova and martial arts champion Irina Rybnikova. Number 1. Attack on Gu Ping Han In late August of 2021, a New York City Uber driver suffered a severe eye injury after he'd refused an illegal street hail in Manhattan. 45-year-old Gu Ping Han, a Chinese immigrant, was stopped at a red light when an unidentified man gestured to get his attention and demanded the driver give him a ride. Han declined and tried to explain that he couldn't take him as a customer. Only yellow medallion taxis were allowed to pick up street hails in the city, meaning that Han would have been breaking the rules by accepting the ride. The driver's window was rolled down at the time as he'd been airing the car out after a previous customer had reportedly been smoking marijuana inside. Without warning or provocation, the man who tried to hail him used his cell phone as a weapon and struck Han in the face. The device's edge severely damaged Han's right eye, causing him to suffer a detached retina. The driver was a sole provider for his wife and son, a 22-year-old student, both of whom were still in China. He was left unable to work. Han went to a hospital where staff reportedly told him that he should have the eye taken out because there was no chance he'd regain his vision. A month after the attack, he still wore a bandage over his eye which was still swollen. Han remained hopeful and told a media outlet, if I became disabled, it would put my family in trouble. Dashcam footage from Han's car, which was released by the authorities, remained the main form of evidence towards identifying the masked suspect, but according to updates on the matter, no arrests had been made. Thanks for watching. Cell phone service or running water? Which would you rather live without for a month? Let us know in the comments section below.